Jeremy Solak, and I am an assistant professor of writing at Spring Arbor, but not here. I work teach at most of the sites. Um, my wife and I and kids, we live up near Higgins Lake. So, and then this is my friend Sean Hurt, and yeah, I'm Sean, and uh, I'm from Los Angeles originally. This is my first winter in <laughs> anywhere. <laughs> um, Mainly, I'll be sort of talking about um, my experience in Malawi, which is a country in southeastern Africa. I was a Peace Corps volunteer there for two years, so I'll be talking about work and celebration in Malawi. So, and my wife and I homeschool our kids, so that's, we have five kids, and our oldest is a daughter, and the youngest down to, um, he actually turned three yesterday, and put, um, he's got finger paints, and put finger paint in my hair, which is really kind of nice, but anyway. Um, why don't you say a quick prayer and then let's get going. Um, Father God, I thank you for this time. I'd ask that you would help us all to have a better understanding of what you want for our lives, especially with leisure and work, that you would um, order our words and help people to ask um, questions if they have them, and that you would just bless our time and the work of everybody's hands and everybody's downtime. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Um, one of the first things we wanted to start with, um, you know, the title of this, just to remind you, or if you're in the wrong room, is that uh, work is for leisure and leisure is for God. Now, part of where the work is for leisure comes from, Ar Aristotle said, no, work is for leisure, yeah, Aristotle said that work is for leisure, that essentially we should be working in order to have leisure time. But Aristotle, as wonderful of a noble pagan that he is, I mean, he didn't really have the, the, the blessing, I would say, of, of, of grace or understanding how God works in our lives with that. So that whole concept of work is for leisure, it can make us, I think, a lot happier, but it can only take that happiness sort of so far. So as far as if you, in one of the things that we too need to do is like define what leisure is. A lot of times, le one thing is leisure is not really entertainment per se. I mean, it's not just um, it's not it's not just watching movies or or playing video games or or even sleeping a lot. And but it can be what work it, leisure, as defined by Joseph Pieper, the German philosopher, is it is contemplative. It's to contemplate sort of what is really good and true and to understand that. And in a way that's not just intellectual only, but so that it can have a, a lived experience part of it. Essentially, leisure in its proper way is that we can, so that we can understand what it means to live truth and goodness in our very, so that we can have it like in, in, our, in our skin and in our mind and all of that. So. Or can I make one yeah, or please. one comment? Um, you're saying it's not just you know a, a contemplative sort of ra or even kind of rational um, mindset. It's it's a lived experience. So it's like I was thinking of it like um, yeah, leisure is is can be contemplation over God's goodness and the goodness of God's creation, but. More than that, we have to, we, we celebrate God's goodness. We celebrate the goodness of creation. We do that through real physical, you know, physical acts of leisure. So I just want to throw that No, out. I mean, yeah. where it's definitely, like, where it's willful. Like, we choose, I mean, like, this is going to be a time of, uh, of leisure or, or set apart from work. When we were talking about this um, topic originally, um, because you know Sean was in Malawi and saw there, you know he went there to help people through the Peace yeah, Corps. And I mean, one thing that struck me, he said, "Well, actually, I think I got a lot more from them." Do you know what I mean? While I was there, and he said, "You know, we're supposed to have this superior—I don't know if you want to say—at least economically superior culture." But he found that actually, yeah, I don't think you can just say it. Like you, we we approach the problem as. I mean, in a sense, yeah, like we're superior. Like we're, uh, you know, people think of it like, yeah, we're going to go teach them certain things. That's a little bit presumptuous. I mean, if you look at it objectively, right? I mean, but that's very much the mentality. And yeah, I got, I think I, 
really didn't realistically benefit them that much materially, you know, but spiritually they helped me to grow so much. So. And his word, word he found that he was really given to in that situation. I think a lot of, my wife and I decided to homeschool our oldest daughter is 14 um, because we were, uh, and the school was sort of a drag. I mean, our life for, for the most part was geared on undoing the drama that happened at the school day. And I'll spare you some of that drama too. But so we decided to homeschool and a couple of our friends um, homeschooled their kids. And honestly, I was pretty, I was, I well, not pretty, I was highly ignorant because the only person that I knew that homeschooled growing up was a guy who was on my football team who didn't talk very much, you know, and that was my one experience. And so then I was somewhere else and it's like, I, I remember having a conversation with a student who is at a university out in South Dakota where we lived at the time. And I, he hands down knew more than I did about history, about a number of different things. And it was part of his homeschool and education. He was just, he was excited about learning and our friends were homeschooled. So we decided to homeschool. I think um, for us, it, I mean, I think God used that as a tool to sort of to change, at least for my wife, my wife and I, our lives, because it showed us really what was important about family and those responsibilities and and spending time with our with our kids in a meaningful way. Sometimes it's easy, you know, because when you send your kids to school, well, there's a professional teacher, there's a professional doctor, there's a professional pretty much everything. But when you when you're with your kids, as you know from the good times that you've had with your parents, um, then it's really it can really be a humbling experience. And I think that homeschooling, and why we chose to talk about Malawi and homeschooling in context with work and with leisure is because we found that there was a certain, I don't know, these experiences gave us a certain amount of humility about how to look at things. Basically that we were wrong before and that we saw that there was truth and goodness out there that we just didn't even know much about which then got us onto the concept of, you know, leisure. We were talking about our problems in our own culture. Hmm. And so as far as, like, the problem with work today. So then what we're going to talk about now is just the, what we see as the limits within work in our culture. Okay. Um, well, I think the main thing that Jeremy and I wanted to express about the, the problem of work in our culture is we, we tend towards, a men, or I see, a mentality of thinking of work for work's sake. You know, do we, it's this kind of classic question of do we eat, or do we work to eat, or do we eat to work? You see what I mean? You know, uh, what is ultimately our life about? And if we, you know, you can kind of also think about this as, uh, Man does not live on bread alone, right? There's more, much more to humanity than just our material needs, of course. I mean, we all acknowledge that. So I think that um, that was just kind of a, 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 a cultural aspect of our culture that um, both Jeremy and I saw. Another thing, too. You know, I don't, we were talking with some of you in the beginning. Part of, the, I mean, I think both of our attraction to the concept of leisure as being more than entertainment, but something that actually kind of restores, can restore your person and help you to see things rightly, was partially a dissatisfaction with, with work, with feeling like, you know, it, sometimes you come, you know, well, if you've ever, you know, if you've signed up for a class too many and that kind of thing, and you realize that I'm an idiot, and this is my, you know, and then you think, you just find yourself, I'm so far behind, it's Saturday, I'm not, I'm where I hope to have been on Tuesday, and this is only going to be like this for another 10 weeks, I'm so glad that I'm alive, thank you God, kind of thing. Do you know what I mean? Have any, have, have any of you experienced that kind of not so grateful feeling before? Okay, so, uh, and um, is the, there has to be, there has to be more. So, but then in trying to figure out the problem, like how can, how can we make work better? I mean, how can we make it so it's something really meaningful 
all the time. And so I said to Sean, I said, well, I mean, work is for leisure and leisure is for God. And Sean said to me, well, you can't really separate it out that way. And you can't really do that because it's then, then it's only, you know, then your leisure is only on Sunday, technically, or maybe your leisure is only in the evening time or something like that. So it's not like we're, you know, if you're one of those people that um, during Thanksgiving, you like the trays that have all the little thingies so that, you know, your cranberry sauce doesn't mix with your gravy, you know, I mean, that's just, if you're like, if you like things, everything to be neat. And sometimes we need that distinction because cold cranberry sauce is really not good with warm gravy. I just don't like it very much. And, but if you are doing it, but other times though, you, you know, when things on your plate, the flavor swap around, I don't know, it's like a soup, life is a lot better that way. So what you, what for at least for me was when I found out that I needed to have more leisure time it was to like separate, first to separate off. Like, okay, I'm done with my work. This is the work time is over. And I'm going to make my weekends just my time for my family. And not even check email. Because if you ch uh, for me, if I check email, it just could be a never ending story of, of just email checking all weekend and then sadness for everybody else in my family and then eventually sadness for me. Okay, so then we go to leisure and then leisure is for God too. Sean has a story about Malawi that helped me to understand this, and actually I'm going to ask if you okay. can share that. Yeah, so that's the main reason I came here, so I, I wanted to share my story about this, because, yeah, as you were saying, um, and also kind of like what Joseph Pieper was, was seeing, is that there's not, perhaps in America, kind of a lack of joy, a lack of celebration in our work, right? I mean, we almost see that as, antithetical, right? I mean, some of, some of you were saying how I wish I could see joy in, in the work that I do or see meaning in the work that I do. Maybe meaning's a little bit easier to see. But I, I wanted to just share um, my story of uh, just what I saw in Malawi as far as work went. So in Malawi, uh, the place that I lived at for two years, it was just a rural farming village. No water, no electricity, no roads, no stoplights, network, uh, internet, uh, phones, so on and so forth, right? And um, it was just a far total farming community. Everyone's a subsistence farmer. And during that time, um, there's a very long dry season. You can almost think of it like the winter out here in Michigan. Everything dies. I mean, the trees die. The, all, you can't do any gardening. You can't do any work, basically, because all your work, or most, most all your work, is through agriculture. So everything dies. The roads just turn to dust. There's dust and ashes everywhere because of wildfires that pop up. And people have a lot of idle time. They have a lot of, you know, maybe what we could think of as leisure time because there's just nothing to do, you know, and it's too hot to do anything anyway. You want to like sit under a mango tree the whole time. So when the rains come, this is a very joyous occasion. Now think about in, in your shoes, like if you had like a six month long vacation, this is the dry season, last six months. You had a six month long vacation of no work and then all of a sudden your boss calls you and be like, okay, you gotta come back to work now. You know, would we hear like anything but groaning, right? I mean like that would just be like so miserable. I mean, you know how you feel for the most part. Well, I don't know, because a lot of you are homeschooled, but you know, the summer before you, you, you start going back to school or the day before you go back to school from summer is kind of a depressing day. But it's not like that in Malawi at all, at all. Because when the rains come, this is a joyous occasion. The whole place comes back to life. The whole forest just swells with all the fruit. There's lots of wild fruit. All the mango trees, the guava trees, the papayas. Um, the forests fill with mushrooms, caterpillars. They eat caterpillars. They're actually quite tasty. But... <laughs> But there's this sense of God's bounty returning back. 
And um, another strange thing is also all the flying ants and flying termites just like fill the skies. And kids will go around like snatching these out of the sky and popping them into their mouth, you know. And, uh, <laughs> and so it's a very joyous occasion. And this is the time when the rains come that people return to the fields. They return back to work. And there's... Would you mention, like, yeah. all the generations, too? Yeah, yeah. And this is a time when grandma and your mom and you and your little brothers and sisters are all going back to the fields together. And they start tilling, tilling the earth, making their gardens. And they do this all with a hoe. There's no ox and plow. Like, this is, like, before the Bronze Age. These one thing about what you mentioned all the families. I mean, you have a unity of your whole community with everybody going together. Mm -hmm. Do you know how sometimes you feel? Uh, it's I, one of the things that I like about homeschooling when I learn things with my kids, and it's like a discovery of the actual learning in it. And when that, when I heard that story about a whole community going to do it, it's like there is a there's a sense of right order with everybody like you can participate singularly and with all like across the age groups and i thought i don't know I, that really struck me as being pretty sweet because we so rarely have that in our own lives yeah it's it's working with the family it's a community it's a cultural event you know this this coming of the rains and the beginning of work in the garden it's something the whole culture is participating in and something that they know that their ancestors have done for hundreds of years also, which is something of itself. So after the planting's done, there's what comes a hunger season. And the hunger season is when the granary is empty from last year's harvest. And people literally are hungry. And I don't know, like being here in Michigan and seeing how people kind of get during long winters, like I, it's almost kind of similar. Like people start getting into sort of bad moods, you know, and even more so in Malawi. Like, people are very despairing during this time. You know, they call it the hunger season for a reason. And during this time when children are born, they'll name them these very depressing names like poverty, um, despair. Uh, what was the other one? Um, oh, sorrow. Like that, or, or problems. That will literally be their name, the name of the child born during the hunger season. That's what they'll call them. <laughs> so you kind of know like when people were born by their names sometimes. So there's just this despair that is all of a sudden um, wiped away clean by the harvest season. And when the harvest comes, I mean, it's just a, you know, like it's a joyous, joyous occasion. The granary was empty. It starts to be filled, overflowing with, with maize. Um, there's suddenly like vegetables and good things to eat again, like pumpkins and fruits and all of like the greens and tomatoes and onions, so many great things. And also people start selling their crops so they have money, which they had no cash money for the longest time too. So they start, they can buy meat so it's a time of communal celebration. You know, everybody is, is rejoicing, you know, in God's bounty. And I just want to tell you this story because I want you to see, like, this is work in Malawi. You know, how does that compare to the work that we do? How does that compare to, you know, a lot of us, if we're, you know, like white collar workers, like going into the office and, and preparing documents and whatnot. Uh, you know, there's a zillion, zillion examples you could give. But, you know, I just, I, I kind of want you to compare that work to work here. When, when Sean talks about the celebration, that spirit of just sort of like thankful, I mean, you know when you're really hungry and you, you go, you, when you go for a walk outside and you've, you've been doing something or you've worked outside, and you're hungry afterwards. And it's almost like the food tastes better. There's a certain relish to it, you know? And I think that, what struck me was their whole life was kind of like that. That there wasn't that this living, not, not just necessarily a living closer to the land, but it was a, their work was in harmony with their needs. And I think sometimes understanding work are like, well, what are my needs? 
I mean, because, you know, if you're working overtime because you just need a new car or want a better house, you know what I mean? When your needs out, when your wants outrun that, then you end up just putting in more time for work where it's like we don't really need luxury stuff, you know? I mean, I mean, you think about it like work for work's sake. Um, I mean, if, you, if you've ever had a car that like breaks down all the time, like our car before our last car, and you're constantly taken to the shop, hey, there's something to be said about having a car that's maybe one under warranty because you don't have to pay for it. And I mean, you know, if something goes wrong, and two, that actually you can arrive somewhere on time. So that's you know, so I'm not knocking like a reliable vehicle, but you know, sometimes they think if we think about okay, if work is for living for what we need to meet our needs, you know, physically and spiritually versus work is so we can have nice things. You know, I mean, that, I mean, if your work is a drag, then you need the Starbucks coffee every morning. Do you know what I mean? In your Lexus cup holder. And I'm not knocking Lexus too, because they're a reliable car. We don't have a Lexus, but you know, but, I, but you know, you can make, but you, you see what I'm saying though. If we want things, if our, if we are working for things that we don't need, what is our, how is our life ordered? So one, this whole leisure time, okay, the Malawians tend to get it a lot, at least part of it, better just naturally out of their actual need for food in their community. But how does that come back to us, you know? Um, and I think one of the things was that whole contemplation, like thinking about what is true and good. There's one thing, we have to kind of understand um, something that, a concept that, um, Work is for, no, how does it go? Truth is for freedom. We have to, contemplation gives us the idea that gives us the ability to seek for truth with our mind and truth to understanding. So truth, at first we can seek in leisure. Because, I mean, if you think about it, if you're sitting there contemplating work, you're not, build, you're not helping anybody build a car, you're not helping anybody build a house, you're not helping to garden, you're not really doing much. I mean, in, in, the, in the work, life is for working, you know, contemplation and prayer are kind of a waste of time because they don't produce anything. So, you know, but we're not here to tell you that prayer is a waste of time, just so you know, and especially since this is being recorded. Um, and uh, <laughs> since I have five kids, you know, so too. So anyway, but um, the, but, so if you have contemplation, that time away from work, to really understand what's important and what's true, then you can make choice with freedom. So truth, we have leisure to have sort of under, to seek truth. We have truth so that we can have freedom, and we have freedom so that we can choose what's good out there, so that we can find what's good in life, find what's actually meaningful in life. And then that goodness allows us to have closeness with God enjoyment with God. So truth is for freedom, freedom is for goodness, and goodness allows for closeness, closer with God. And the reason why that, I mean, if we are ordered to our proper end, which just basically means that we're moving things out of the way that allow us to have a close relationship with God. I mean, you know, we can... I mean, everybody has a dark night of the soul. And some people really, I mean, that's kind of their particular cross that they have to carry, is a kind of depression or sorrow or melancholy that just seems to be part of the body that doesn't really go along with anything that you're doing wrong. That's not what I'm talking about here, and that's difficult. But for a lot of us, you know, there is just a natural, that sort of ache for more, I think is a sign that there is more and that God can give us that happiness and joy in, the, in everything. I mean, so when we have the goodness, we don't really know how to be good if we don't know what goodness is. And so therefore we need to study, we need to seek, to think, to observe. A really bad Shakespeare play that I don't like, although I love a lot of Shakespeare's plays, is um, Love's Labor Lost. It's like, this is a drag to just horrible play for the most part. But one thing in the, that he says in there is, this, this guy who said, well, the, this educated guy said, well, where did you learn that? He said, well, it's a penny's worth of observation. And it's like, we expect so much from our education, we have to learn things officially. We have to be degreed in it, we have to have certification of it, and whatever. But that, this education is supposed to serve like a real heart, and a real soul, and a real mind. And so 
we have to be open to it and see with our, our soul's eye kind of what's most important. And, you know, one, we have the separation. But it, once we have God, then it kind of begins to work backwards in that God goes back into our leisure time and goes back into our work. And so it's really not our work so much that's giving us the joy, but it, that it's God in it. We see the purposes of it. And so that story of all of the people, you know, working, going to work in the fields together and their happiness and joy of that, just it just you know, contrasted to my own heart and sometimes and um you know our culture in general it was it opened up that window to that and you know there's no doubt it's like back breaking work i mean it's like they're doing this stuff with like a hoe they're hoeing like two acres of land seriously think about that hoeing two acres of land i don't know if you've ever seen an acre but i mean it's, it's huge it's a tremendous amount of work but what amazed me is that there was an air or a spirit of celebration in that work. There was a joy in it. And um, I think that that's mainly what I wanted to convey is that even our sort of most humble work can have be infused with an with air of leisure or an air of celebration, an air of joy, if we can see how we are... Um, if we can see that in our work we are in a sense sub-creators or co-creators with God, that we are working together and that we are in a way kind of sharing in one of God's, you know, one of the major aspects of God is that he is <coughs> a creator. So I think that you got a much stronger sense of that in Malawian, in Malawi, in, in, in the process of working on a farm and you know you maybe you till the land but god gives the rain you know there's a much sen greater sense of being a a co-creator with yeah. and, and with homeschooling you know how you're growing things like with the garden how many of you have gardened much in the past i'm just curious about how what the experience okay so you know i mean you have well how many of you have killed a plant before <laughs> okay good so we have more experience that's actually kind of funny um but you know it's you you learn what not to do you know partially with gardening and what works and what doesn't work but um <coughs> that tendon um of things you know one thing that homeschooling and for those of you who homeschool you know this and you probably i i would actually actually, actually like to ask you a couple of questions too but we'll but i can later but um is with the parents as far as you know, one thing I've always, I've been frustrated with with myself, when you homeschool, you have to admit, one, I'm a fallen creature. Because you can't blame it on somebody else. You can't blame it on your, you can't blame it on, your, well, you can. You can blame it on a teacher. I suppose I can blame it on my wife. That wouldn't be a good idea, really, either. But you, the whole thing is, the responsibility is we have to take responsibility. For, you realize, and I keep spitting, and I apologize for that, um, is that impatience is nothing like dealing with impatience if you have it to homeschool. So... And I think that causes you to say, hey, this isn't really, if you're seeking what's good and true though, when you realize something's wrong, I remember what is, what is the saying, pain is to the body what guilt is to the soul. When we have guilt for something and it's real, it's, it's a good thing because it's a warning signal that helps us to know something is kind of off and wrong. And with homeschooling, it's really humbling because you realize um, there's this one writer, Melinda Selmes, and she wrote that even our most exalted faculties are in need of redemption. And to me, it reminds me a little bit of Aristotle. I love Aristotle's writings, not the easiest you know, in the world, but he, he still, he said he got, uh, just using reason alone, that God exists, but he still are in need of redemption. I think humbling um, experience that comes from homeschooling because with with children you realize I, this is what I think I realized is that children are children and that you need to constantly but they're with you for at least 18 years and that it takes time to raise somebody but there's a delight in the work you know that um the story that Sean, you know that Sean told us about <coughs> delighting with the labor I think homeschooling gives you the opportunity at its best to delight in being a family 
in the giving and the receiving. And homeschooling tells you that you can learn from your children and you can give back and you can move forward and you can find like a community. One thing I've enjoyed most about homeschooling is it's like you can share the joy of discovering truth and having it be part of your family at its best, you know. Um, I guess I could throw in here too that if you're talking about humility, like one of the, I think Peace Corps was like the most humbling experience, you know, because you're like going here, theor theoretically you're supposed to be teaching people, but you have like the vocabulary of like a, th you know, like a three-year-old. So, I mean, it can be like, you know, it's, it's, it's very humbling and you learn really, that, or I've learned, maybe other people are different, but I've learned that, um, you know, I, I came in there kind of being so presumptuous that I had so much to teach people, and really it's like they're the ones who taught me by far so much more. And I'm, I mean, like, I was actually like an atheist before. Like, I don't want to get into like some conversion story, but I was an atheist there, bef you know, before I went to Peace Corps. So, I mean, they're the ones, the Malawians were like the ones that brought me to Christ in the, in the first place. So, anyway, humbling, yes, humbling. <laughs> But I think leisure, because it gives you the opportunity to know what's true and good, and because you really value it and know what's in the heart, I think humility kind of goes along with it. Because then if you really understand what's good, you know, you, you see the goodness in it and you appreciate it. And it's no, I was reading something, actually it was by Dietrich von Hildebrand and not by Pieper, but um, about how <laughs> we're created to... I mean, we can know good things about ourselves. And it's kind of hard when you're writing your resume. It's like, oh yeah, this is a good cover letter. This is a good CV, this, you know what I mean? And that kind of thing. And you're trying to build up all of these skills. But leisure helps you take out, I mean, it's one thing to have a job and it's obviously, it's good to eat and better than to, eat, you know, to work than starve to death. But it's, if you, but that's not really, I mean, you know, what Sean said, we, Christ said, we can't live by bread alone. I think leisure gives us the opportunity to understand to seek out what are our real spiritual needs, what it means to be a human. You know, like a good film could be a good movie, could be, it could potentially be a leisure activity if it helps you to have a deeper appreciation for what's true and good. And remember, it's not just the intellectual aspect too, but it's like when you, what it's in the living it. It's when the, it's there's like a, connection to your emotions in part out, out of curiosity because I don't actually know what you think of this like what because there's a difference of course between free time and leisure and so can you maybe flesh that out in practical terms like what would kind of maybe be not free time something you're doing in free time is not servile work but also not leisure as far as there is this one, our culture, because you know, remember when work is just for work, when everything is just for being, building, getting more luxury goods, getting more whatever, more stuff, you know, then we start discounting, this isn't have any value, this isn't a good use of your time, you know? And there's this book, you know, if you were to read it, read it with critical eyes, but it's called Last Child in the Woods, Saving Our Children from Nature Deficit Disorder. One of the things, I find to be particularly leisurely is being outside in the woods, you know, or in the snow. I love snow and I love the cold weather too, but it's, you know, but um, I, I, when, I think when you're outside and you get a chance to like take in, you see, you see God's hand and stuff. I mean, read through the Psalms. I mean, and you hear David's response to that. I think we should all be shepherds, personally. I think the first year at Spring Arbor, everybody should be a shepherd for a year. Because you just get to look at the stars, you get to be around sheep, that kind of thing. You know? Obviously, I did share this idea with some people, and they, they, didn't, they weren't too interested. But, um, <laughs> and, and hey, I can understand that. But one of the things about free time is if you're in nature and you're appreciating the value of the beauty of things that are outside, I mean, in a way, you can, you, that, that comes from God. It's not nature, nature worship. I mean, it's like, you know, it, what is it? Worship the creator, wonder in creation. But that wonder, that irresistible being pulled to what some, the goodness of something, I mean, I think that's what we're supposed to be called to. Leisure just isn't like a, like a dry contemplation about something, but it's like a loving it with your heart. When you begin to, you know, some, like if you've listened to a song or something really beautiful and weird, 
I mean, weird and not, not um, strange to you. And you, you listen to it something, and you're like, this is really, this has really struck me, you know, in a way that it breaks you out of that kind of work everyday mentality into more <coughs> of openness to things. And I think, you know, Sean, when we were talking about leisure, talks about celebration. And I think he's, I, I like that. But, you know, le life is kind of a gift given to us. And I think that helps us, that gift part, helps us to appreciate the, the leisure, the, the, the time when you're not producing anything, but you are being human in the way that God intends us to be, in a really broad way. And, you know, for some of you who are, um, like, biblical studies majors and, you know, theology and that kind of thing, I think it would be a little bit difficult because your work is so tied, or though anybody whose work is tied to a particular ministry, it's like, well, how can I get outside of ministry but not... Um, how can I get outside of ministry? Basically, I think you should surf, because Peter Grief wrote a surfing book, and that that's really good for you. So I forgot what I was going to say with the surfing book this year. Um, so if you're a biblical studies major, you should surf. Yeah, yep. That's that's the that's the cure. Surfing. Now we should have written that on the thing, but he wrote a book called "I Surf, Therefore I Am," and. Um, <laughs> Surfing's not good for anything either, but it can help you. Peter Kreef argues philosophically that it can help you get a handle on ha seeking joy in your life. Do you know what I mean? So the one thing about leisure is it's dynamic in the same with humility. Somebody have a question? Or so. okay. Yeah. I think that's kind of, a, that's kind of a, a good overall summary of what leisure is, is that whole, I surf, therefore I am, is that you're doing something that's totally totally in a material sense ridiculous like it's it, I mean if you were just looking at it as if material things were the only things that were worth our time and, and energy and then the the concept of leisure is like just abhorrent like an abhorrent sin really you know so and it's not you know there are two, I wanted to pass around two other a couple other books this is leisure Peep, Joseph Pieper's um, leisure the basis of culture um, and this is um, a book by an author who is kind of a prig sometimes. He gets a little cocky and snobby about homeschooling that I want to write him and tell him, but I can't do it yet without being too angry and not sitting, so I haven't written him. Um, <laughs> but, it's a really, but it's really good research, and it's called Homeschooling in American History. Um, you know, because, you know, we get this idea that homeschooling hasn't been around for a long time. I mean, C.S. Lewis was homeschooled until he was about 10 years old. And then his last few years, like a retired principal taught him. I mean, so one thing, though, um, I would want to pass those two books around. <coughs> With the work, there's this idea, if it's not hard, it's not worth doing. You know what I mean? You, you find out, you know, if it's really hard work and it's costing you a lot and you're sweating blood and it doesn't kill you, you know, and you're miserable, then it must be better. That actually comes from Kant, who said, who kind of has that argument. He basically says, an act can't be morally good unless you hate it. You know, well, you know, the reality is, I mean, in order to be good, we need to know what goodness is, we need to have, be in the habit of practicing it, and we need to be in the habit of desiring good. You know, and we can deceive ourselves easily enough on the habit of knowing what's good and the habit of practicing what's good, but it's really hard I mean, I, to deceive yourself about, do I desire what's good all the time? And I think leisure and prayer are kind of like two ways to sort of, you know, overcome that in some ways. And that ties into... Maybe over, overvaluing hard work. Yeah. As the, or valuing work is the only thing that's worthwhile. Work, good, that's, thank you. I, the work is, work isn't good only if it's hard. But work is good if, it, if we know it to be good, and we know the good work is valuable and truthful. I mean, remember, too, Jesus, I mean, you know, he, he was constantly going away from things. I mean, going up on mountains and looking, you know, spots. And I think he was getting away from the world. And I almost think if you climb up a mountain, you look at it, you get perspective. I mean, he was getting spiritual perspective and physical perspective. So, 
I think leisure kind of is one part to give our intellects that perspective and can be like a like a good friend to our spiritual lives and prayer and everything. Did you have? I have no further comments. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions? Yes. Where would you draw the line between leisure and laziness? That's a good question. Um, Sean, would you like to answer that question? <laughs> yeah, that, that is a good question. It's like, you know, and a lot of times people, like people used to, or, you know, would say like, okay, well, laziness is a sin, you know, and, but then also in, in the same way, like being constantly busy, you know, is a sin also. You know, you're supposed to keep the Sabbath day holy and you're supposed to take time for, for non-servile work, so. Yeah, so personally, I would say I would be lazy personally when I was no longer fulfilling my own, I wasn't working hard enough to fulfill my own material or my family's material needs. And beyond that, you know, maybe that's... And, and the needs is important, not just the wants, but the needs. The needs, yeah. This, the other thing... Um, with, uh, there. If it's all about, I think, I think laziness and pride and sloth, and Peter talks it about it to, and I've forgotten the term, acedia. Acedia. Yeah. Um, he in that is basically when you be, you stop looking outside of yourself. I think a proper healthy leisure time, laziness kind of looks inward and thinks only about the individual souls, pleasures, and avoiding pain. But I think leisure is your gaze is outward. You're thinking about creation. You're thinking about God. You're thinking about the other wor world. And, but not just intellectually, but you still have some participation in it. And I think that's a good, important distinction to make. It can't be just you know it's good, but it has to be you have to be draw your whole person into it, you know, as far as with the heart. I mean, including sometimes your emotions, too, with it. But that can be hard, and that's a little bit relative. Does that help? Yeah. Um, I wonder if I've got two or three four things that keep running around in my head, but I wonder if you um, might comment on the intersection or either intersection of or, or distinction between like leisure and Sabbath. And Sabbath not as in a real regimented thing, but in in God's desire for us to rest and the create recreation in that. Is, is, are you asking in effect like what's the practical difference between leisure and, and Sabbath or? Or if you see, or if perhaps you were worried, using leisure as somewhat overlapping with Sabbath. Well, I, mean, I personally think it overlaps quite a bit with Sabbath. I mean, that's, if not being almost synonymous. Or would you go that far? Or? It's uh, uh, it's almost like a messenger for the Sabbath during the week, honestly. Do you, you know what I mean? Because if you have proper leisure, it's almost like a leisure is going to prepare your time for that Sabbath. You're not going to be so worn out and strung out. Uh, one, of, one of my, you know, Sebastian Mafood, one of our, um, he says, some, I, mean, I think a part of leisure is also, I think, being humble, because in the sense when we have to know our limits. And a friend of mine has said, if you keep missing deadlines on things, if you've committed to so many good things, you know, it's like a la carte or being in the cafeteria where it's like, oh, I'm so, you know, you take more than you can possibly eat. Sometimes I, we take on more than we can possibly do. And maybe we can, you know, do it for a week or for, or two, but in like the regular practice. Sometimes we're just, we haven't grown to the point where we can do everything that we think that we can, we can do. And I think leisure and humility help keep us rested so that by time the Sabbath, so that we can actually wake up for church. <laughs> I mean, I'm serious, because you know how sometimes you're so exhausted come Sunday? It's like, as you just... Can I follow up on that? Yes.
was that um, I've been reading some books that they were talking about other countries having a premium on understanding the value of work. Mm -hmm. um, and a guy was interviewing some people from Google, and they were talking about that they want to make the world so less people have to be employed all the time so they can think or something. And I, what I, I was thinking when he said that was, well, that's not going to happen. I mean, they're just going to go play more Angry Birds. But what occurred to me was that maybe, you know, sometimes realizing that you have this time because we have the gift of a lot of free time relative to countries that have subsistence farming, for example, that, you know, using your time for good things, not necessarily, because consuming isn't necessarily wrong, watching a movie isn't necessarily wrong, but take advantage of the, the, the extra amount of time we've got. We have a gift that they don't have as well, and we're just squandering it, maybe it's, it's they take advantage of what little they have better than we take advantage of what we have. Yeah. That makes sense. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I was just going to say that's kind of like what I was asking like what's what's the difference between just free time and and leisure time, productive leisure, you know, just productive leisure time. I mean, that's kind of what you're getting at, right? I mean. Yeah. yeah. I want for, you know, I think sometimes with our time, we kind of live, you know, you know, for any of you who you know, have had experience with factories, that like on-demand factory work or just-in-time shipping, where things get there right as they need to be. So there's no waste, <laughs> you know? Okay, so the idea is sometimes that we don't really, I think we're like that way with our money and our time. And I think, you know, who said that a small mistake early can lead to a big mistake down the road? Is that Aristotle that said that? Uh, but I think sometimes if we are careful, cautious with our money, we put ourselves in situations where we have to work more than we need to. And I think, I think even more importantly, I think we're that way with our time. I think sometimes we schedule, I know that we need some, I know we need some, I know we need order. I'm all for order. But sometimes I think we schedule ourselves where if a family member is sick, we don't have the time to take care of that person. Or if our, you know, if you have a grandparent in the area, you can't, you don't go see because you're so busy with all of the stuff that you're doing. And I think that's what homeschooling has helped with me. It's kind of opened my eyes to my family is important. You know, my kids are important. They're worth my spending, investing the time. I know everybody's not going to homeschool, but that lesson can be applied whether you send your kids to public school or private school. It's that just being with them you know, understanding their value as a person, you know, and I think it's, that's, my eyes have been opened to that. Yeah. Okay, um, my question is a topic of advice for practical living. What kind of advice would you give or what would you say to someone who has found themselves already in a soul-sucking situation where their energy on a daily basis is zapped and they feel that there's no escape, kind of no light at the end of the tunnel, and they have kids or people that they want to be in community with that they know where to help, but they don't have, like, they're working so hard that they have no view of what leisure time looks like. How do you, once you fall into the cycle of being into a soul-sucking environment, how do you escape that? I don't know, that's a good question. Practically, what, you, what, what, what could you do? Practically? You know, you know Ben Carson's mom who raised him and she worked two jobs? You know, the doctor who gifted hands the movie or whatever. <coughs> I, I think... You know the Brother Lawrence book that he wrote, the guy who was a monk who did wash dishes and wrote the spiritual book, um, what is it called? Practicing the Presence of God. I think sometimes in certain situations you do the best that you can. Uh, or, but I think you have to... I think if we're really honest with ourselves, I think we can rely a lot more on God and have more happiness. Because there are some people and we've all met them who have jobs that stink, who are really busy, and they still have joy. I'm not one of those people. So, <laughs> I mean, I'm serious. I mean, that's kind of something I'm trying to, in my own life, trying to have more, 
not necessarily balance, but order, like a be like a better perspective on everything that I do. But I think you know, it reminds me of some of the the virtue of prudence, you know, of just practically knowing what to do, and and kind of a prudent thriftiness with time and things, and then getting and and that spiritual reliance on God. Because another thing, you know, we're, we're generally pretty impatient people. We're quick to say yes and get ourselves into trouble. Do you know what I mean? But sometimes, I mean, sometimes we have to honor our commitments. Like I agreed to do something. I agreed to. I happily agreed to help edit a book, but I really, but doing it caused me to be behind on almost everything else. Do you know what I mean? And it kind of. And I. But I'm. I, I'm going to honor the commitment to do it, and then I'm not going to say yes again. So, I don't know. Does that make? Does that help at all? Yeah, what would be a first principle? Uh, that's, that's what I would uh, ask. What can you get right in order from the very beginning? What's the first step? You think that would be the most important. It involves, like, with other people, too, you sure. think? of intuitive answer to this and I can't imagine I'm an expert in this situation where a person's in a horrible soul-sucking job where they have children to support but I guess my first intuitive guess would be like it's not like as if this soul-sucking job if you have you know a big family is meaningless because you're certainly raising your children you're certainly providing for your family off of it so I mean you can see the meaning and perhaps even the joy and as soul-sucking as the actual physical work may be. I mean, maybe that's a first principle. <laughs> to, to see the value in, in, in the suffering. Hmm. Oh, I, that's a good point, yeah. Do you know, I mean, because sometimes there is a certain amount of suffering and we shirk away from that. And I think we can pray that that time will be shortened and ask all of our friends to pray the same for us, you know, but and also just to see, I think, to see things as they really are, to the real value. Because if you, I mean, if you're serving your family and you have to do that for a year and a bad job, I mean, there's still some value with that. I mean, and God can show it to you. And also, the other thing is kind of being creative. We were talking about looking at other cultures and other things. What can be, what's real? I mean, what do you, are we, are the way that we're looking at things, is it the real value? You know, we know that Shel Silverstein poem said, my, you know, the dad gave me a dollar and I traded the dollar for two quarters because two is more than one and then three dimes because three is more than two and then four nickels because four is more than three and five pennies, five more than one. He went back to his dad, you know, and he said, look, dad, I have five. Aren't you proud? And the dad was like this. It's like, oh, that's like, that's why we homeschool. Parental failure. Parents need to take responsibility. It's the parent's job to teach the value. You taught the kid math. Teach them about what's good and important and true. And then most of the time, like for myself and my wife and I, we don't know half the time. Because we just, we haven't, it's not what we study. We, you know, our culture didn't teach us what's most important, which is ridiculous. And I have student loans, like you all probably will. You know what I mean? It's like, I want to, but then it's like finally take responsibility for yourself too. Is kind of, and then leisure kind of, I think, helps a little bit with that. You know, what in Shakespeare's play, like a, have the p penny's worth of observation. Really kind of, and ask God to help your intellect to understand things. Because then you can find, you know, some piece together more joy that can hopefully be passed down to the next generation. Because our work here is partially for the next generation, you know. Well, I can tell you one practical thing that happened is I value, I mean, I'm a graduate student right now, but I value my graduate student community much more than I did before. I mean, I, and I've tried very hard to cultivate a, a brotherly community in, among our graduate students. Um, not only because, maybe because of material reasons, oh, maybe that's 
maybe that'll make us uh, better workers, but just because that makes such a much more happier environment to work in for me, to have sort of brotherly solidarity among my, my fellow graduate students and also, a, you know, a kind of a, a support network, you know, because graduate school can really get you down once in a while. So that, that certainly, you know, in, in practical aspects of my life, it, it affected me in that way. And that was all because of Malawi and what I saw in Malawi. Answer your question? Does anybody else have any questions? Would you say that uh, video games have any value in Nietzsche and Leisure since they have no connection with reality for you? Some people don't. I mean, just. just I, I didn't mean that to sound sharp, but just that um, like discussion of other people. Right? Would you? Uh, I said, aren't people reality? I mean, most of the people are playing multiplayer stuff nowadays. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's social and bonding. That, that as well. I, I guess, from our perspective, just taking that into account, I guess, like, yeah. I, I kind of agree with you. Like, I, you, there can, I think it could be, like, certain situations would not be very leisurely, you know, really antithetical to leisure. But other situations could be like leisure. You know, if you're having a wonderful time, enjoying your friends, and you're blessing and praising God because you know you had such a good time, then that's leisure, right? But in the other way, it could be something like turning into yourself and and uh, cutting yourself off from reality. And you know, reality is supposed to be, or I'm sorry, leisure is supposed to be a time in which we really focus on what's really real. You know, not the not the material aspect of our life, but the, the ultimate reality. So, I, I was thinking, you know, I started cross-country skiing this year, which I really enjoyed, but sometimes when it becomes the end in itself, because I, sometimes I did it with my kids, and then it's like, oh, I just want to go out and go fast and go far into the woods, you know? When, when the activity becomes the end in itself, instead of it being like a true friendship, do you know what I mean? I mean, I, I think anything would be that way. I tend to be a little judgmental too, uh, honestly, and so I'm looking. I look for opportunities to um, put a little grace into it. Yeah, I I I, I play video games, so I'm, I'm not. Okay. But it's just a, it's just a struggle, and I I guess if you were to take out the multiplayer part, would there be value to it? Would there be value if you're not interacting with other people? With and I don't know the answer to that, but I just would there be value? And I think the serious one. My wife and I got rid of cable about two years ago, and I started reading actually about six months. I loved HGTV. You know, I could tell you, we could tell you if they're going to choose the flat that had the, um, the interior balcony or not. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, it's, but we got rid of it, and it took me six months not to go into the television room every night at 10 o'clock or 9 o'clock when we would normally sit down to watch TV. Six months. It was like, it was painful for like three months. You know, it was sad because I didn't have cable. You know what I mean? But, and then what happened is started the books that I had been collecting but hadn't been reading. I started reading them about a year later. I think with some things, you know, if, if you were to say TV and video games, sometimes, sometimes there are better things out there. Do you know? I was thinking that there might be a sort of honesty you have to have with yourself and also, like you were saying a moment ago, the medium where there are certain video games where there's a storyline where we see a character really develop and you come to better understand what humanity means and what it means to be human and face you know, different adversaries. But then there's some where it's, it's definitely mindless. If I, I press this button over and over again, then like hopefully I can get my high score up on the scoreboards or whatever. Right, and so that's not like, I think it would go back to if we looked at it from a scriptural standpoint, where whatever's good, whatever's lovely, we take upon these things. If it's enriching you, because there's also movies where you could, and books, you know, there's certain times where you can just, it's, um, it's 
except it's violence porn or poverty porn or just regular porn where you just like engross yourself in these awful ideas and it doesn't have any value. You're not reading it because you want to hear like think about what did the broken leg do and you just want to like read the gore. So you have to be honest with yourself, how much value is this truly enriching in myself? And I think leisure can give you I mean remember part of the leisure is figuring out the real value of things. I mean, I think even the Bible, I mean, scripture reading, I mean, if leisure is really for God, there's a certain enjoyment in meditating on scripture. I mean, think of Psalm 1, the guy by the tree. I think, it, I think, I mean, besides the goat shepherding, everybody should go read their Bible under a tree by a flowing stream. You know what I mean? I think that would help everybody feel a little bit better about, you know, about life in general, at least initially, especially if you have a fishing pole, too, in the water at the same time. But that might be a distracting thing like video games do sometimes. Oh, sorry, that's my phone. <laughs> I hear it, I'm supposed to pass out um, from the if, uh, a folk, for the sacred ground, so it's a buy one, get one, 50% off. Does anybody have any last questions? Um, I was going to tie in with what they've been talking about. Is I found um, sometimes, um, I'll admit, as somebody who's got ADHD, my brain runs about 700 miles an hour. Sometimes what I'll do, um, for example, I'm, I'm a huge fan of Mike Horton and his The White Horse Inn and stuff, and I'll put on discussions of, of things that I, I want to understand or learn, and sometimes that just gives my hand something to do while I'm taking in thoughts, because if I just sit, I wander, I stop hearing, I stop thinking. But I used, I used to literally take a really one of those mindless games, and what I would do is I'd put it in front of me, and it would entertain the faculty that needs to keep twitching, and I could, I could understand better that way. Um, I'm fond of doing homework with music in the background for the same yeah. reason. And sometimes I think it could be an accessory. Is this the same way the, the stream helps you read? Because it, 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 I don't know, it helps your environment help, is conducive to what you're doing. Sometimes you can get, because it is vacuous, it lets you fill the other half of your, your attention. Because I think a lot of people nowadays, we can't be in a silent room. But I think leisure and wonder, like wonder time, can kind of help you to develop that. Because we're, we're, all, we're doing habits, and when we have habits, we have to deal with them. You know what I mean? Down the road or not. But... I was saying it can be an accessory to it. In, in some cases, you might find it helps. It, it might not be antithetical to the vacuous thing. might just help you. Sure, I mean, I would, yeah, I can see that there would definitely be exceptions to, you know what I mean, to certain principles. I was just saying it might be, it might be you know, in some cases everything may have value, you know, there's, there's situations where it's just a thought. Last question? Or comment? Okay, and put them out at the library. Okay, cool. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Have a good day. I hope that you have more leisure time.